Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. The mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever and ever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever, and by the grace of God, we will carry on His love endures forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong forever God is with us forever and ever forever God is faithful forever God is strong forever God is with us forever and ever forever Amen. Amen. You can have a seat if you'd like. Perfect. 
It's all by your grace. I want to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling you've given to me. I want to walk. to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling you've given to me. I want to walk in a manner that's worthy of the gospel, your amazing grace, your amazing grace is perfectly Give 
give you my heart I give you my soul I live for you alone Every breath that I take Every moment I'm away Lord, have your way in me Lord, I give you my heart give you my soul I live for you alone every breath that I take every moment I'm away Lord have your way in me
place at your feet, Lord. You are my Savior, and I'm at your mercy. All that has been in my life up till now belongs to you, for you are still holy. can heal a wounded soul what can make us white as snow what can fill the emptiness what can mend our brokenness brokenness mighty awesome mighty awesome wonderful is the Restores our faith in God What reveals the Father's love What can lead the wayward home What can melt a heart of stone What can free the guilty one What can save and overcome Overcome Mighty, awesome Power of oh, 
mighty I'll stand for the last one. seems that we're never as satisfied in this life than when we surrender to you and ask you again to reign in our life and take over the wheel of our life. We're never as satisfied when we let go, when we scoot over, when we bend our knee and stop insisting on our own way and resisting your will. We're never as much at peace than when we just lift our palms open to you and say, Lord, your will, not mine, be done. That's what we want tonight again, in a fresh way. We come to your truth. We know that you fashion our life with your truth. You use your word to conform us into the image of our Lord Jesus, Father. 
And that's what we truly desire. We know that that means affliction. That we know that that means suffering sometimes. Being misunderstood. Yet there still yet is not a more peaceful place in the eye of the storm of your grace. Your will tonight. Speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thanks, man. Thanks, bro. Good evening. Nice to see you here. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4 this evening. Pastor Kelly and I and Garrett were making our way through the pastoral epistles, which is 1 Timothy, the book of Titus, and 2 Timothy. We're in chapter 4. The title of the message tonight is A New Diet for Godliness. Or I can even say a New Year's diet for godliness. Every January and February of every year of our life, the gyms and the exercise establishments are full to brimming over making revenue and income. Usually lasts six weeks, January 1st to February 15th. You know, frequently goals and resolutions only have a life of six weeks. So we have to be pretty realistic with ourselves. Baby steps, baby steps. And so, you know, they bring in all this cash, and they bring in so much dollar that it holds them to the rest of the year, even long after their new gym cadets are gone. It's so interesting. We get hyped up. You know, those of us, we've let ourselves go through the year. You know, you got mid-February to December 31st, and then we expect a miracle in six weeks. <laughs> Which is not that possible, as you know. And so we just want to bring change. As I said on Sunday, if you were there, um, nothing changes if what? Nothing changes. You can say that to yourself over and over. It could be at your work. It could be at your parenting, your marriage, your friendships, your family of origin, your faith. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Okay, we can go home now. <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's true. I know, I know professionally and in the workplace, uh, uh, you've heard this before. I've heard it for years, but it just it's so fresh and makes so much sense. And that is the definition of insanity. Do you know what it is? The definition of insanity? Yeah, there you go. It is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's the definition of insanity. And so, you know, here we go. So, Lord, what do you want to shape and mold into our life in a deeper and new way this year? Lord, how can you reign in my life in deeper ways this year. That's the prayer of the Christian. That's the desire of the Christian. And so um, we're going to talk this evening on the subject of going on a new diet plan of godliness tonight. A diet plan on godliness tonight. So for those of you that are kind of gym buffs and you take pride in, you know, working out and doing what you need to do, um, there's two rules always. And there's only two rules, and it's always been this way. Rule number one, 
if we want to get in physical shape, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we want to get in physical shape, you must alter your diet and eat the right kind of food. Rule number one. Okay? Everybody good on that? I'm going to ask you. There's only one more rule. What is that? What? Consistency? Yeah, that's, that's the rule. But there's only two things. If you must know, how do I shed these pounds? How do I look better? How do I feel better? How do I take care of this temple that God has given us more efficiently? There's only two ways to do it. On a physical level, dieting and exercise. There's not a pill that does it all for us. I was at a, a, a new doctor that I had the other day, and, you know, I was, you know, I, I just was not feeling up to snuff. And uh, she said, well, you got to do this, you got to do that. And I go, don't you just have one pill? And she started laughing. <laughs> There's never just one pill. It's dieting, eating the right food. And sometimes I say eating at the right time. Like you don't want a big bowl of pasta at 1030 at night. No, you might want it, but you shouldn't do it. Or half a gallon of ice cream. Anytime for that matter. But you can be disciplined as much as you want and eat all the right foods, and we've all gone through these phases in our life, but eat all the right foods and be so disciplined and not do this and eat that boring stuff. We've done it. But none of it matters if we're not exercising. If you only watch your diet, you will lose weight. But all it will look like is soft muscle. If you only work out and eat any junk food you want, you're going to get big all right. <laughs> Maybe a little stronger. They have to go together. Amen? Well, we're going to see what Paul says to Timothy in terms of his new diet of godliness tonight. He actually uses this terminology. He uses terminology like gymnasium. Training ourselves, eating the right foods, and behaviorally pumping iron. And so many words. Okay? Now, in verse 1 through 5, let's read that together. What we're going to find, and Paul does this, he flip flops back and forth in the first book of Timothy on the issue of false teaching and error, which is similar tonight as junk food. Nothing nutritional in it. Matter of fact, you all have a heart attack, a spiritual heart attack if you keep eating that way. So he talks about error and what it does to us, spiritually speaking. It's a death blow. It's something we must be very careful of. And Paul mentions it over and I mean he's on a, he's on on a uh, he's on a real mission here. Now the interesting thing is Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy are his last books he ever wrote. 2 Timothy, which is one of my favorites, is a book that he wrote when he was in the the hole in the ground that's still there. You can go see it to this day in Rome. The Mamertine Prison. He wrote 2 Timothy. And at the end of 2 Timothy, he said, the time for my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will not only give to me, but to all who long for his appearing. 
So there's a sense of urgency for Paul for his people to feed on nutritional truth, namely the Word of God. Not the junk food of myths and conspiracies. Truth. And so he starts with that. So let's read it first. He's first of all going to highlight what he doesn't want God's people to stand for. And boy, if there's ever been a time of distruth and myths and conspiracies, it's in our culture. And we, our believers, are different. We're raised on different food. We have different desires spiritually than our culture. If we don't, we should. Verse 1. Paul writes to Timothy, his son in the faith, Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in the latter times, the latter times, and that's the time from the birth of Christ until he comes back. All of that, those thousands of years, are referred to as the last days or the latter times. The Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith Depart from the faith. These are Christians, professing Christians at least, that drift and depart from their faith, from sound doctrine, from the truth that was expressed to them. How? By devo- devoting themselves, devoting means hard commitment, and running in that direction. Away from truth. Away from it. They will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits. Now what he's referring to is he's referring to the demonic, deceitful spirits in the hearts of the false teachers that are bent in leading God's people astray. And Paul is furious that this is happening. As we talked about earlier in Acts chapter 20, when Paul left Ephesus, this is a, a, he's sending his son Timothy to pastor Ephesus and clean house. Well, just six years earlier, Paul left Ephesus and Timothy there, and he said, I warn you, there's going to come sheep's and wolves' clothing, wolves' and sheep's clothing, to devour the congregation with false teaching. Be on your guard. Well, unfortunately, what he said would happen six years earlier is, in fact, still there and starting to grow. And so he tells his young, shy son in the faith, who's probably in his mid-30s now, you're going to go there, you're going to teach truth, and you are going to run off these heretics. That's your first assignment, Timothy. And this guy was an introvert. We talked about that a few weeks ago. He did not like this kind of confrontation. And many of us don't. But if we're going to grow up in the Lord, we need to do that sometimes. Especially if you're in a leadership role. Or especially if you're a mother or father in a leadership role. I might have told you this before. It was never God's will for a 5-year-old and a 15-year-old to run a household. Did you know that? Never God's will. I don't care what they want. I don't care how loud they stomp their feet. Never God's will for your child or your teen to be Lord over your household. So remember that. Whatever it takes to love them, to lead them, and to say no to them, do it. Yeah? Yeah. 
Some will depart the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity, he's describing now what these people look like, these false teachers look like. First of all, they are scarred with the presence of Satan in them that would ever suggest that there's any other truth other than the gospel. Through their insincerity, they were in it for money too, through their insincerity of liars whose consciences have been seared. Seared. Now that word seared actually is branding. So for those of you that are farmers or work with stock, when you brand your animal, that dictates that he belongs to you as its owner. It's your branding. And so what Paul has said is saying is these men have weaseled their way into the congregation, the foundation and pillar of God's church. And they've allowed themselves to be cauterized, their spirit and their heart to be cauterized, burned, seared by the stamp of Satan himself. That's what he's saying. Their conscience is cauterized away from truth. The truth nerves in their conscience have been burned. That's who we're talking about, Paul says. Now, what do they do? What is their false teaching? Look at verse 3. Who forbid marriage, they felt that getting married was abominable, unforgivable sin. And they forbade and required abstinence from foods. So you might, you might want to call them a vegetarian or whatever you want to call them abstinence from certain foods that God created marriage. He created marriage, and he created all foods, actually. All foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything by God, everything created by God is good. Everything created by God is good. All foods are good. Foods. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God, because the word of God states that it's holy, because it's good, because he made it. And prayer. So these particular false teachers were falling into their theology of abstinence. Another word is called asceticism. It's what um, many monks, um, ill-informed monks in those days, in the days of old, would do. They would allow their bodies to, to suffer malnutrition because they felt that it would make them holier and God would be pleased at it. They felt that if you got married, that was nothing God wanted. Matter of fact, what they said was that the body... These teachers taught that the body was evil. And so all of life was spiritual. 
So they forced their people to abstain from marriage, which God created, and said, I have made male and female. Totally sick that that's uh, an offense in our culture. It's like, what? God has made male and female. And the two shall become one flesh in marriage. Yes? Please say yes. Thank you. Um, and don't ever call what God calls good evil. And so that's what they were doing. That was the false teaching. The work of Christ was not enough. And I don't know, in the human spirit, there just seems to be this drive to have something to do with our salvation. Something. There's this drive because it's called pride and ego. And to just accept the grace of God, despite the wreck lives we were when we came to him, for some people is very difficult to believe. Certainly, I must do something more other than bring my life and brokenness to Christ for his forgiveness. Certainly there must be more that I should do. Well, there is, but it has nothing to do with our salvation. It's just kind of like when we come to Christ, things change in us because we're new people, we're born again, the old is gone, the new has come. And in a way, it's maybe in some ways even beyond our control. Because we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us now. And so now our desires totally change. They should should change. Now some of our vices in life that we've participated in for many, many years die hard, a little bit harder than they should. But we are forever growing to be made in the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a good thing. A good thing. So there's something in us that just fights with Christ doing all of the work for us. There has to be something else we need to do. One of the saddest stories I have as a pastor many years ago, when I pastored in uh, Eureka, uh, there was a lovely family I visited one day and uh, shared the gospel with them, and all five of them came to Christ. It was amazing. Amazing. And for six months, they all radiated Christ. Their joy was enviable. And they couldn't ask enough questions, and they couldn't read the Bible enough. Until one day, the father, who was clearly the leader in that home, they listened to the father and they watched him receive Christ and they just followed suit. Children all the way up. He found a book behind a dumpster one day that emphasized strict 100% obedience to observing by the letter of the law the Sabbath. The Sabbath. And the first thing he did was he brought this book to me and he was angry at me because I didn't share that with the family. And I tried to explain to him that I didn't share it with the family because Christ is our focus, not a religious day of festivities. Now, obviously, there's one day a week God deemed that we should rest from work. That principle should carry through with us. There's seasons when we don't do that, but you got the point. But as far as a set Sabbath day for the born-again Christian, it is no longer something we need to adhere to. Okay? Because if we did, 
we'd be meeting every Saturday, not Sunday. And we'd have two services on Saturday, not just one. One in the morning, one in the evening. Okay? So I tried to reason with this guy because what, what he was doing is he was becoming legalistic. You must add this to your salvation in order to be pleasing to God. And I said, no, you don't. Christ has done enough on the cross. We don't need this. And then I read this to him and didn't even phase him. This is in Colossians. Mark this if you know people that are focusing on the minors rather than the majors. This is Colossians, verse 16. Paul says to the church there, because they were having the same problems as the church in Ephesus. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you. He was passing judgment on me. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance of our faith belongs to Christ. Not special days. It belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you in insisting on asceticism. That's what we're talking about. Abstinence in order to feel holier or garner God's approval. Let no one disqualify you in insisting on asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by their sensual mind and not holding fast to the head, Christ, from whom the whole body is nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that's from God. If with Christ you died, now think about your life if you're a believer. If with Christ you died, and if you embrace Christ, the Bible says you died with Christ. Like your life and your sins were on the cross with him. Do you know that we died with Christ? Our old man in our despicable sinful past and all the other sins after that have been put to the cross, nailed on the cross by Christ. His body hung there to pay for our sins. So he says, if with Christ you died... To the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Like there's only one commandment now. There's still ten, and we the principles are still in force. But the only one commandment we're given in the New Testament is to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, Mind and soul, there's two actually, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that's even whittled down further to love Christ and only Christ. So he said, why, you're acting as if you were still in your sins. When you lived the life that said, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that all perish when they are used, according to human precepts and teaching. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom and godliness, an appearance of it, promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So the bottom line is, this is what they were teaching. There's more you got to do. And Paul said, I don't want to hear it. Throw them out of the church and have nothing to do with these fables. Nothing. 
That's pretty strong, huh? Pretty strong talk for an introvert, Timothy. Let's continue on. Okay. Now, he focuses on the subject at hand tonight, a new diet for godliness. First of all, let me just tell you that one of the best diets for godliness is to eat the right food of his word. We feed our faith through God's word, the bread of life. The worst diet is to eat the junk food of heresy. Okay? It's toxic. So look what he says here to Timothy, verse 6. Now he's talking to his son. He says, if you put these things before the brothers, the things I'm telling you to do, I want you to confront false teaching, and I want you to uphold the truth of God's word. If you do these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Now, the word train comes from the word gymnasium. So he's saying, Timothy, you need to start eating the food of the word. You need to train your body to get spiritually healthy. You only do that through God's word. That's where it begins, right there. Whether you hear it on Sunday, whether you read your private devotions, whether you're driving up 62 and you're listening to a song and there's scripture to it, whether you're teaching your little child a Bible story, the word of God is everywhere, and we feed our lives on it. We have to train ourselves. We need to discipline ourselves to continue to do this. Otherwise, we get emaciated and weak and start to drift. By the way, when he said that they were wandering away, when an individual is deceived, the drifting is very very subtle. The deception is very subtle. It might seem very um, practical and godly on the surface, but when we drift, we drift. I remember uh, Charles Stanley, he's a preacher, you know Charles Stanley, many of you. He was preaching, he said, you know, he, he was from Atlanta, and when he would just swim on the coast there, out of Atlanta, um, the Atlantic, he, he would set up coconuts on the beach and he would go out in the water because the coconuts were directly down from his parents. And he said over and over and over again as he was playing in the surf, uh, it wasn't very long that he looked up and the coconuts were way over there. He was drifting and he didn't even know it. You know, deception by definition is the person that's deceived can't see it. Only other people can see them drift, but they can't see it. That's actually the matrix and the nature of deception is we don't see it. And so they started drifting, and he says, Paul, and he says, Timothy, I want you to start eating the right kind of food. Then he says, verse 7, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Nothing to do with it. Spin on your heels, walk away from it. Someone comes to your door, different faith, different belief, you can offer them cookies if you want. But once they start in on their doctrine, and you know it's not Christ. Say, I'm a born-again Christian. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Is that not Christ-like? He's saying have nothing to do with them. Like nothing. 
It's toxic. It's like toxic fumes, gas fumes in your house that you can hardly smell, but it, they're there. Have nothing to do with the irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Train. It's a workout. We feed our body with truth. It takes time. Sometimes it, there's a lot of conviction that comes with it when we read the truth. Do it. It'll strengthen you. I remember my mom saying, you know, I didn't like to eat broccoli and stuff. Still don't. My wife, Jenny, who was a nurse for 37 years, says, it's the scrub brush of the, what is it? The colon. It's the scrub brush of the colon, Bill. You need to eat the broccoli. Well, it looks like a scrub brush, too. Now that I think about it. And so when I was little, I would hide the broccoli and the peas under the mashed potatoes. You know. And my mom would catch me. She also was a nurse. I can't get away from them. And she said, Billy... And you remember this. If you're my age, you remember, you remember the lines that your parents had. I mean, if you're over 60, you'll remember these lines. Just think about the poor people in China. Now, a 10-year-old that doesn't want to eat his broccoli never has that cross his mind. <laughs> but she said the same thing over and over again. So anyhow... It's good for you, they say, but it tastes so bad. The other thing my mom gave me that I just, I, I thought, Mom, you got to be kidding. Liver. I go, why, Mom, why? Okay. For bodily training, listen to this, look at verse 8. This is interesting. For those of you that are not working out or not taking care of your bodies, this, this is like, you know, uh, you'll feel good just for a brief moment when, I say, when Paul says this, okay? He says, train yourself for godliness, verse 7, for while bodily training is of some value, only some, but it's of value, godliness is of value in every way. So I can yeah, I know how we think. So I thank you. Because godliness, Paul says, benefits me now in the present and in the future. Working out with weights or power walking through a park or eating more broccoli, that only benefits you now. So why go to a gym? It shows so short term. So you don't die of cardiac arrest and you take care of the temple God's given you. You'll feel better, feel healthier. Yeah? I'm not going to ask any more questions. But he says, you know, face it. It's just temporary. You know, and I have another whole thing, and I, just pro I probably shouldn't go there, but I'm just going to put it out to you real quick. Because this might, it could, if you're extreme, go into the area of trying all of the products to help us look younger. There, I said it. I remember about six, seven years ago, I noticed that I started having a receding hairline. And so, you know, I saw all these infomercials on TV, you know, you just take this product, you do this, and your hair follicles start growing back. So my, my, the lady that would cut my hair, it, born again, solid believer. And I said... Now, this is embarrassing for me, but do you have a product? I mean, does that stuff really work, first of all? And she goes, yes, I have the exact product for you. I'll give you a whole 
box of them just to start you off. And I, you know, I think there were, they might have been pills, I'm not sure. Or they might have been, st I can't even remember. I have PTSD from it, so that's what the problem is. So <laughs> I think it was something I rubbed in my hair. And I did it like twice, and I looked, and I go, this stuff's phony. <laughs> There's nothing growing back. And I was telling my wife about it, and she was just dying. I remember it was a Sunday morning. And we were getting ready for church. And she called our hair lady, who was a good friend of hers, uh, or she texted the hair lady, and she found a picture online of a guy who had hair that was like an afro that went out to there. And she texted it to her girlfriend. She says, it's already working for Bill. <laughs> Anyhow, let's get back to the word. Okay, so he says, verse 9, this saying is trustworthy and diver, uh, deserves full acceptance. He says that about five times in this book. This is a trustworthy saying. This is not a myth. This is not based on good works. Everything I'm telling you now about feeding on God's truth is worthy of full acceptance, and you can trust it. For to this end we toil and strive. I mean, it's so true, we're giving our lives. Eleven out of the twelve apostles were executed. They did not do that just on a hope that what they saw as a risen Christ might be true someday. I said it on Sunday, James, the brother of Jesus, the head apostle, apostle in Acts, was thrown off the roof of a temple and beaten and clubbed to death. Would he do that just for a half-brother or for the king of kings and lord of lords? So for, to this end, we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who's the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. And then the last section I really like a lot, he's giving some father, spiritual father, son advice on how to feed your faith. So the two things I talked about earlier, you must eat the right food, and you must have exercise. There's no pill. Those two things, you won't find anything other than those two things that work, that actually work, okay? The two things that feed us spiritually and build us up in our most holy faith is the food of God's truth and the conduct and the behavior that the Lord grows us up in. It's our behavior that the Lord helps us do. And i got to emphasize that because I'm weary. I'm weary about bringing any type of teaching to you that is a list of things you have to do. I'm weary of that. That's actually not even the gospel. The gospel says it is all in Christ. It is all of Christ. It is all from Christ. And his grace is sufficient. Period. Now that we're in him, these are the behaviors that should be natural, right? They won't get you into heaven. Christ already has already written, off, written that off for you, going to heaven. It's just that this is what we look, you know, I never met my father until I was 10. Never met him, never heard his voice. My parents divorced when my mom was pregnant with me. They got back together. When I was 10, the six foot two Irishman walked into my living room, December 23rd, 1962, and I couldn't believe this is my dad. The interesting thing is, I never saw the guy. I walked just like him, I laughed just like him. It was amazing. We are to look like Christ. We're to look like Christ. And so let's see 
how this workout's going to go. This is how, what's it, what our growth should look like as believers. He says this to Timothy. Okay, verse 11. Timothy, I want, to, I want you to command and teach these things. He's got a bunch of elders in there twice his age. They hate him. They hate him. He says, I want you to command and teach these things. These are not optional. These aren't suggestions. These are not, try these things if you, they fit you. These are commands that to be, should be taught in your church. Let no one despise you for your youth. Now you've got to think about it. The, the boy was intimidated. He's in a church. Three times Paul says, do not let them look down on your youth. He's 35 years old. Do not do that. And you know, when you go to a new area, where well, he had been there for a while with Paul too, but when you're the pastor of a new area or the leader of a new job, and a lot of the people that are in leadership there, you know, 20 years older than you, it could be a little intimidating. And he says to this young man, do it. My presence, the Lord's presence is with you. Just speak the truth and do it. I call that, I've mentioned this before, facing your Goliath. We all have Goliaths in our life. People that we hope we never have to talk to or people that we hope we never have to confront or people that we hope we never have to say no to. But as Christians, it's like spiritually pumping iron. Step up and do it. Especially if you're abused. I'll just throw that in. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for youth, but set the believers an example in speech. Uh oh. In other words, Timothy, you're, you are to be an example as their leader and pastor. And I would say this is of parents as well. Anyone in a leadership role that loves the Lord. We are to be examples of the words that come out of our mouth. There's nothing more embarrassing than a three-year-old swearing at a Thanksgiving table. He says, I want you to be an example to your flock on how you speak, how you vent, how you get angry. James says it's impossible to control the tongue 100%. But he says if we can contain, if we can tame lions, tigers, and bears, and elephants, and dolphins, the Lord will help you tame your tongue. No excuses. And I know we know how to do this. You know, I've had people tell me before, like a couple's counseling or something, and the, one of the spouses, she, he says or she says, you know, the way they talk to me, it, it happened in the kitchen the other night, and the way they talk to me, and, and, and the, the other spouse says, I couldn't help it, it just came out. I go, really? It just came out? Yet this is the same person that was in a heated argument with their spouse the week before that, raising their voice, using colorful language, and then the phone rang. So they went from meh, 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 to hello, praise the Lord. Don't ever tell me. More importantly, don't try to justify before God that the words just came out. That's the lamest excuse I've ever heard for a Christian to give. Be an example. By the way, here's a good verse for those of you that, that probably frequently see, sin, sin with your tongues. You know, it's not just swear words and stuff. It's just like, like never shutting up, and that's probably one of my biggest challenges in life. My wife says, you wake up talking, you talk all day, and you go to bed talking. I said, honey, it's a gift. <laughs> it's... So here's a good verse for you. When we're, these are all Proverbs. 
When words are, I love the way he says this. This is just like hilarious. When words are many, sin is not absent. This is Proverbs. When words are many, and they are with me, sin is not absent. Like the more you talk, the more you'll sin. Isn't that interesting? That's probably a challenge for some ladies in here. I, was, I, I heard uh, Gary Smalley. Gary Smalley, who's with the Lord now, wrote a book um, on how men should love their wives and how they should respect their husbands. And he said, did you know, guys, that the average man speaks 12,000 words a day, but the average woman speaks 25,000 words a day? So when you go home, you're done, and she's just getting warmed up. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm not sexist. Don't take that wrong. Some of my favorite people are females. I have six granddaughters. I have women in my family everywhere. I adore all of them. I'm not sexist. I love my wife, too. Example in speech, conduct, how you behave. Timothy, doesn't matter if you're only 35. You be an example in your conduct. Nobody's perfect. So if your conduct's not hitting on all cylinders, humble yourself in front of your children and ask them for forgiveness. Dad, if you do that, they'll never forget you the rest of their life. They'll never forget that moment. Be an example in how you love people. Be an example in your faith, in your purity. You are to behave in these ways. It's godliness. It's what Jesus looked like when he was here. Then he says, verse 13, And come, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, which is encouragement, and to teaching. I learned in Bible college from our uh, professor that taught us homiletics. You can preach very, very strong information, but don't you ever leave that congregation not built up in their faith and encouraged. Never leave that congregation down. That's called exhortation, encouragement. And that's what he's supposed to, that's what you're supposed to do, Timothy. That's who you are. Then he says, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. You have to continue to do what God has gifted you to do. And all of us have gifts. You know the spiritual gifts. All of us have gifts, differing levels. And the Lord wants us to use the things he's gifted us to do to edify one another in the body of Christ. It could be anything from hospitality to showing mercy to teaching to giving financially. I mean, there's 28 of them. And you have one or two, just like I do. Use them. Practice them. You'll find more joy in that than just sitting around any day. But look at verse 13. Practice these things. Practice these things. You know, with Kelly and I and Travis and Rick and um, the other brothers do when we teach, we've had to practice that. It doesn't sound very spiritual, does it? Practice it over and over and over. Keep doing it. It's what God has called you to do. It's part of your godly life in this case. Practice it. The first time I had to ever get up in front of a group of people, I was probably, well, I was 24, and I went to a junior college, and I go, well, I think the Lord's calling me to do something, and I'll just go to a junior college, and we'll just start from there. And my first class was an an oral speech class. So we had to do an oral book report and bring it in, a study a book and bring it in and in front of the whole class give a breakdown on it. Before I got that door, I almost threw up. I almost threw up. 
Now I can't wait to get here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Do you know the number one fear in America is speaking publicly? Did you know that number three is death? Most people would rather die than get up and speak. But if you're called to do it, it takes practice. And then you won't feel as nervous as you used to. You have to have a little nervousness or you don't depend on the Lord, though. I will say that. Don't neglect your gifts. How do you know what my gift is? How do you know what your gift is? By desire. What's your desire? What do you want to do in the body of Christ? What do you have a heart for? What gets you enthused? What could you do? What would you do if you had the ability to do it? Usually those desires come from Christ. And they're to be practiced and nurtured with time. Practice these things, devote yourself to them so that all may see your progress. In other words, you know what? Stop putting all of your energy in your insecurity about what these older people are saying and instead focus on what God's called you to do so they can see your progress. In time they will. This is godliness. This is how we grow as believers. We feed on the word and we pump the iron of new behavior with the Lord's assistance and we get stronger. We watch our tongues. We check our conduct. Our lives are congruent with the Holy Spirit that's inside of us. Not perfect. Not perfect. If we confess our sins when we fall, he's what? Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you remember having a one-year-old or a two-year-old child and they're learning how to walk or ride a bike or whatever and a little one-year-old child falls down on the ground, stumbling, learning how to walk, do you yell at him? You pick them up, brush them off on the butt, and say, come on, son, let's go. Let's go. Just because we don't get it right kind of makes the Lord smile, I think, sometimes. And he graciously picks us up and says, let's go. You belong to me now. And then lastly, verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself. We've got to analyze ourselves. This is for all of us. Just like check where you're at spiritually. Where are you? He already knows. And I think he wants you to know. He wants me to know. Do an analysis. Lord, what do you want me to do? I want to grow this year. If nothing changes, if nothing changes. I want to grow this year. I want to be stronger in my faith. Can't do it without you. My desire is that you make me stronger in my faith. So that maybe by the end of the year, I mean, just out of interest, we can actually measure. You know, maybe the the last year when someone cut you off at 62, you did a little bit of sign language. This year you go, what an idiot. I mean, that's progress, though. That's progress. The next year, you might go, oh, Lord, I guess we'll have to go through this every time we go to 62. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. James says, be not many teachers or you will face a stricter judgment. That's what he says to teachers. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Not salvation, but in the growth of godliness. Lord, tonight, all of us love you, committed to you. We all agree that there's no way we have anything to add to our salvation. You completed it when you said it is finished on Calvary's cross. However, 
We know that we're to be fashioned into your image and look like you did when you were on earth. The grace, the winsome, the charm, the patience, the compassion. We want it. But Lord, would you do it in us and through us. And for other areas, Lord, that really get us down about ourselves. Lord, those areas we have fought over in ourself, as you know, for years. And I guess we're here to tell you that we can't do it by ourselves. We can't change that about us. Will you, in your grace and power, do the work in us, through us, and for us? In Jesus' name, amen, amen. <laughs>